Well, hi, and welcome to another Peak Careers interview. Uh, we've done a couple of with uh, with Skip Skip Niles here uh, in the past. Uh, Skip, uh, I'm I'm uh, about 25 minutes away from his camp that he hangs out in, and kind of grew up here, where we are right now. And, Absolutely, yeah. And uh, we were we've done a couple interviews, and it's nice to be able to connect with with Skip occasionally throughout the summer while he's uh, hanging out here in Maine. But today, uh, we did a couple of interviews on the Hope Action Theory, and I, I wanted to talk a little bit today well, with Skip um, about what, what has he learned over the past 15 or so years of, of this, any new uses, and uh, um, maybe what we should do is just do a quick, uh, uh, who are you? I guess people, oh, most well, people probably ooh. know you, but... He, uh, yeah. Well, that's the big question right there. there. And I who think am that's, I? I think that's where we're going today, too. <laughs> that's but, right. But uh, yeah. uh, Skip, known, also known as Spencer Niles, Dr. Spencer Niles, and he's going to be uh, keynoting the MACA conference this year. And so I was excited. Uh, anything else? What else? Where, where do you maybe a blip about where you where sure. you work? And Sure. Yeah. 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 So uh, I am a professor at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Prior to that, I was a professor at Penn State. And before that, I was a professor at the University of Virginia. And primarily in terms of uh, career development, I've been involved with the National Career Development Association, been president a couple of times and on the board for, oh gosh, at least 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that's been my main affiliation professionally and through that work I've gotten to know people like Jim and uh, other other folks who have become not only colleagues but good friends and so uh yeah it's it's just been a lot of fun all the way yeah. all right well let's let's dive in so this hope action theory uh I love this theory mm -hmm. and uh but it's and it's been around for something like 12 15 years yeah. or something you yeah. said and yeah. I'm just sort of curious what else What's sort of evolved? What's come? What are some new uses, or maybe some uses that you could foresee using uh, this theory in? Yeah, yeah, great question. Well, uh, you know, just to say something briefly about the catalyst for the theory. One of the things that we realized, and I should say that uh, the theory uh, was developed along with uh, uh, Norm Amundsen and mm -hmm. Hyung Jun Yoon, who uh, Hyung Jun Yoon is a professor at uh, Penn State. He was a, uh, my a doctoral student at, at Penn State. That's how he and I got connected. And then Norm Avenson and I have been working together for, gosh, 30 years or yeah. so. And Norm was a professor at the University of British Columbia. So one of the things we noticed about theory is that no theories really talk about hope. How do you help your clients generate and sustain a sense of hope in their lives? And it's as if it's assumed that your clients will have hope. Yeah, we think it's a bit, there's a bit more to it than that. And that is to say that uh, from our perspective, hope is the fuel that drives constructive engagement in career planning. Hmm. And without it, it's unreasonable, I think, for us to expect people to uh, to even move in a direction that's going to be positive and constructive relative to career planning. Uh, and with it, it makes all the difference. And so, uh, so we thought need to elevate the attention to having a sense of hope. And initially we turned to the work of a person by the name of Rick Snyder, who was a clinical psychologist, um, University of uh, uh, Kansas. And, um, and Rick was um, really the leading theorist when it came to hope. And <laughs> one of the cornerstones with his theory was that yeah, there are three components. You have to have uh, a goal that you're working towards we all know in working with clients how important it is you have a have to have a sense of what you're working towards not that that goal can't change and often it does and often it needs to change as as the uh, work evolves with a client but you have to have a goal that you're focused on and then strategies or pathways for achieving that goal how am i going to get from here to there and then that's not enough it's not enough to just have a goal and, and have an idea of what you need to do to get there there are two big questions that come along right after that. And one is, are you confident that you can take those steps that you've identified to move from here to there and complete them successfully? There's that question. And then, so it's self-efficacy. And then the, the final part is motivation. So you know what your goal okay. is, you know how to move from here to there. You're confident you can do that. Will you do that? 
Will you do that? And so all those components have to be present for helping people move forward. Now, how does this relate to career development more specifically? One of the things we've learned, I think NCDA has been a leader in this in terms of their national surveys, Harris polls, and so forth. One of the things that we've learned is that most uh, adults, uh, employed and, and unemployed, have no sort of framework to use to uh, navigate their career development. Hmm. It's kind of like flying by the seat of their pants, so to speak, right. nothing to guide them in this. So it, uh, hope action. what hope action theory does is it provides those three components that I mentioned. It provides a goal that is um, a decision that you have to make about your career to, to, to state it generally. And, and, then, and then it gives you strategies, steps that you can take. Really, hope action theory is the deconstruction of a career decision. If you look at it. You want me to it. pull that up? Yeah, if you have it, that'd be great to look at that. And then, um, and so, yeah, so these, are these different uh, components of hope action theory, if you think about any career decision you've made, you maybe haven't used these labels, but they've been part of the process for you. And briefly, that what that is, is um, uh, on the outside, you see the environment. The environment uh, impacts you. You impact your environment. And in that constant interaction, we have countless numbers of environmental interactions each and every day. Uh, and those interactions have something to teach us about us. If we pay attention, if we pay attention, mm -hmm. and that's where self-reflection comes in. Self-reflection is taking the time to consider what your environmental interactions have to teach you about you and your place in the world. And you have uh, information that you can use each and every day from those environmental actions, if you're intentional about it. And I'm gonna come back to self-reflection because I think that's become, back to your question, one of the most um, uh, crucial parts of hope action theory for a lot of people. Mm. So we'll talk about, it connects with mindfulness. I know that's what you're, yeah. you're into that, yeah. Jim. And, uh, and so it connects with that and some other things that are, uh, I think really, um, uh, popular today. So, so self-reflection and, and based on self-reflection, which is really asking the important questions, what does this interaction that I had today with this colleague, with, uh, with this, uh, uh, uh friend with it, anything that I've done at work, what does that have to tell me about me? And does it confirm where I am or does it open up the space for me to consider other possibilities? When you begin to ask those questions in self-reflection and then translate those questions into answers, uh, often with the help of a career coach mm -hmm. or a career counselor, you begin to develop self-clarity, a self-understanding mm -hmm. of who you are, what's, what, what's essential to you. And from that place, you can focus on the possibilities, which is really what visioning is about. Uh, notice I said possibilities, not probabilities. Historically, career development has focused on probability. What's my chances for success? Locating me on a normal curve through a standardized assessment, et cetera. That's useful and that can be important. But we think that the, the focusing on the possibilities first is an important way to get people to engage in their career planning from a place of, 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 of enthusiasm, of, of passion, of, uh, of energy that they have uh, to move into, uh, into the different things that they're doing in their lives. And so focusing on the possibilities and the possibilities identifying and uh, maybe one or two options that they can focus on for uh, goal setting and planning. And then once you have goals uh, identified and plans developed, you at some point you have to take action. That's implementing, taking action. Whenever you implement, think of any choice that you've made any choice you've implemented in your life, you, no matter how much you research that option that you moved into, there are undoubtedly things that you learned from about that option once you were in it that you didn't know before you were in it. And so the question is, what do you do with that new information that you get? Mm. And so that's, it moves into adapting. It's like, how do you use the information you have now to either confirm or to nudge you in a different direction uh, in your career development. And so this is a, an ongoing process that uh, can be used to help people have a framework that they can move through their career de decisions with. And as people begin to learn this, what we're finding is that they're mm -hmm. able to do much of this on their own. Sure. 
You know, what's interesting is that uh, I just reread the uh, uh, Designing Your Life, uh, yeah. career, career Life Design, yeah. you know, which is, you know, really the, that's that visioning stuff they're talking mm -hmm. about. What, mm -hmm. what are the, let's, let's prototype a couple different options. Let's, yeah. let's create three different, three yeah. different possible scenarios, yeah. Yeah. right? I mean, I, so a lot of this work is, is, it's nice to be able to see it kind of broken down like yeah, this. Yeah. That's what, you know, because it really does walk us through that process. But I think the most important thing is trying something out, right? When you implement, you got to be willing to adapt. And yeah. I think, you know, the, this whole uh, concept of adaptability quotient, people who are really good at adapting are, are very successful, right? Yes. Yeah. It's such yeah. a crucial. Oh, it, it's huge. Confidence. Yeah. And people, a lot of people think, especially I think younger people might think that, well, I have to know, I have to be absolutely sure. Yeah. I have to know before I do. And what you're saying, the truth is just the opposite. Once you, obviously you make an informed choice, hopefully. Yeah. Then once you implement that choice, then you really know. So it's like you do and then you know. It's not you know and then you do. You know, if you understand, you get what I'm saying in terms of that uh, difference. The thing I always, I, I've always said this about, about career coaching and mm -hmm. career counseling is that is one of the things that we do as career coaches is we give people hope. They come to us going, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. So much of what we do yeah. is, is just, it's like, yeah. well, let's look at this in a different way. And it gives them hope. And I think for me, that has been the magic of for career coaching. Yeah. And that's why I like this, this whole theory is that we, you can kind of see what are the pieces of yeah. this puzzle that do give hope and they all, they all lead to it in the middle. Yeah. So I'm going to take this down so we okay. can keep talking, yeah, but sure. Uh, yeah. Well, one of the things I think you're also hinting at that's so important and that I think the best uh, career coaches and career counselors are so good at, and that is the whole notion of mattering that uh, coaches and counselors are effective at helping their clients feel as though they matter. Mm. And there's that old saying that people don't, care how much you know until they know how much you, you care. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Mm. And so, so yeah, that, that sense of, you know, you come to a place and, and we have a framework and a theory that can help you address the concerns, the career concerns that you're dealing with right now. We can help you with that. We can work collaboratively on that. And, and then really truly listening to what the person is having is sharing. Is sharing. And this gets into, uh, the whole area of um, you know cultural competence and so forth, where you really cultural humility, where you're really saying, I need to learn what the your experience is, what the client's experience is from their frame of reference, uh, uh, culturally and everything to do with their context, mm -hmm. to really be able to understand and then work collaboratively with them to help them resolve their career concerns. So it. it it's a kind of interesting as you and I are talking, uh, um, there's a lot of confluence uh, uh, among some of the more um, uh, recent theories that have been developed and you know, whether it's the focus on adaptability. And, you know, I love Mark Savickas's notion of we're all trying to actively master what we at one time passively suffered. How do we make meaning out of our experience and move a little bit away from uh, testing and telling to helping uh, people make meaning out of their experiences uh, and um, from the uh, objective to the subjective focus on career development in terms of meaning making. And, um, and I think hope, one thing about hope action theory, I should say is that using hope action theory doesn't exclude uh, one from using other theories. For instance, mm. back to uh, uh, Mark's career construction theory, it blends very nicely with hope action theory because mm. we don't we don't necessarily tell people how we have ideas for this and strategies for this but you know you can turn self reflection to self clarity a lot of different ways you could use the career construction uh interview to help yeah. people move from self reflection to self clarity you could use a a, a holland inventory to the self directed search to help people move from self reflection to self clarity out of which possibilities are considered. So it, it, it blends, I think, really well with a lot of different theories. One of the things I, I've, I've noticed more recently is the emphasis, and I think, again, you've contributed to this uh, kind of development, Jim, with the focus on mindfulness, and that is people are, and maybe it's pandemic-influenced, 
people, I think a lot of people, especially people who have lived a little bit, that is maybe they're in their 30s, 40s or older, they're beginning to ask uh, some of the bigger questions, right? Yeah. some of the deeper questions about how they're spending their time and what's really meaningful and purposeful for them. And uh, I think those are crucial conversations for career practitioners to have with people who are ready to have them. Yeah, you know, well, we we went on a hike a couple of weeks ago, and and uh, it was great. We had a great great chance to really kind of talk a little bit about you know what 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 am I doing in my life now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think this is where I I see a lot of this you know, developing some hope. It's not about what skills I want to use as much as what do I, what do I, what's important to me? And uh, Skip and I had a great conversation, which was, for me, was very helpful. And it's sort of looking at where do I want to be in the next five mm. years? And and I think that's kind of, you know, that whole value thing is so important in this, in this process. Yeah. Yeah. What, one of the things that I've found to be really helpful with those kinds of conversations uh, frankly, has been uh, poetry. Mm. You know, poetry, some people describe poetry as the language for which there is no defense. That is to say that sometimes uh, a, a, a poem, the right poem at the right time can really um, uh, unleash somebody, help somebody get unstuck mm. from uh, or address a concern that's sort of been in a an abiding concern, but they haven't figured out a way to really address it effectively yet, or they've been stuck for whatever reason. And sometimes poetry, you know, uh, Mary Oliver, uh, who was uh, the late Mary Oliver, who was mm -hmm. a very well-known uh, American poet, uh, she asks a very simple question. What is it you plan to do with this uh, wild and uh, one life that you have to live? What is it you plan to do with this? How are you going to use this uh, this one life, how are you going to use your time alive to really be all that you're called to be? Mm. And, uh, and I do believe that we're all kind of uh, uh, the same and all unique in this sense, in that I think we all have something uh, that, uh, that uh, we're uniquely positioned for as a result of our heredity or our, our context, our living experiences, that we're all sort of positioned to make, in a way, a unique contribution to the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And what if the world were holding its collective breath, waiting for each one of us to step into that one place that only we can occupy in our lives? And uh, that's, that's an awesome question for me to think about. Like, what if so many of us, whether it's because we're afraid or it's just too much work, and I totally get both of those, <laughs> um, that we just uh, uh, just sort of, settles too harsh a word, but uh, we don't step into that place that maybe we are in fact uniquely um, mm. uh, positioned. W one way for uh, thinking about hope action theory is to say that hope action theory is holding, holding the creative tension between what is and what could be and doing something each day to close the gap between the two. Yeah. And, well, you know, uh, and I, I, you say that, I mean, I have a friend of mine who, who really should leave his job <laughs> he really really should he is miserable <laughs> but it it his momentum it to, to move out of it takes one he's it's it's fear right just as yeah. you said yeah and two it you know the momentum it's going to take some energy for him to make that move so yeah. anyways you gotta you gotta well you just sparked a poem let's do this it is, this is a this is a uh uh a poem by john o'donohue from to bless the space between us. John O'Donohue was a, uh, a Irish uh, Catholic priest. Uh, he left the, the priesthood and you know, a PhD in philosophy. And uh, it's an amazing poet that really speaks in many different ways to the human condition. Hmm. And one of his uh, 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 poems is called The Time for Necessary Decision. And it's for people oh, like wow. your friend, uh, you know, that, you know, and, which is, we're all like Different. your. We're all like your friends. All, in sense. Oh, ways. absolutely. We've all been there. If We've not, all we been will there. be there. Yeah. And so this goes something like this: the mind of time is hard to read. The mind of time is hard to we to read. We can never really predict uh, what is. Uh, well, actually, 
I'm gonna ask you, you me to read it. Why don't you, you read got that? The, you don't have your glasses, glasses on. on. You got better eyes. I don't have my glasses on. This page right here? Yeah, right there. There you go. The mind of time is hard to read. We can never predict what it will bring. Nor even from all that is already gone can we say what form it finally takes. For time gathers its moments secretly. Often we only know it's time to change when a force has built inside the heart that leaves us uneasy as we are. Wow, that is strong. Yeah. Perhaps the work we do has lost its soul or the love where we once belonged calls nothing alive in us anymore. We drift through this gray, increasing nowhere until we stand before a threshold we know. We have to cross to come alive once more. May we have the courage to take the step into the unknown that beckons us. Trust that a richer life awaits us there, that we will lose nothing but what has already died. Wow. Yeah, and that's something. Feel the deeper knowing in us sure of all that is about to be born beyond the pale frames where we stayed confined, not realizing how such vacant endurance was bleaching our soul's desire. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. wow. That is and that that's a well done, by the way. Thank I, uh, you. Thank you. I can't see that print. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't rise are better than we mine. didn't practice this. No, we did not. But obviously, but uh, I love I love this. Yeah. I'm gonna take a I need yeah. to grab that from my buddy. Absolutely. Um, it's but yeah. wow. Yeah, the time for necessary decision. There have been so many as as I look at that for me, and hopefully everybody will look at that for themselves. Uh I think about different times in my life where I knew. I, there's a level at which I knew, but I was unwilling to admit that it was time to make a change. Oh, man. I think about my first graduate school mm. experience. I was like 22 or something like that. And about a week into it, I said, you know, it was a three-year program. I said, you know what? I don't think this is for me. You know, I felt that. I distinctly felt that. Mm. And it took me two and a half years to actually do something about it. And the way yeah. I was able to do something about it was... Um, something, maybe it's the wisdom of the ego, whatever you want to call it, uh, the soul kind of saying, pay attention. Uh, I just shut down. And I, mm. and I was uh, in my third year, this three-year program, and I couldn't even force myself to study. I tried, I couldn't. It was, it was like there was a, a wall. I just hit this wall. Wow. And it was time to leave. And I knew it was time to leave two and a half years earlier, but I didn't do it. And so I, that, that's maybe a bit more a, a, of a dramatic experience related to this. But I think that that's the importance of self-reflection oh, in this theory. That, yeah. So self-reflection focuses on slowing down and paying attention. Slowing down and paying attention. And Thomas Merton, the, uh, the, 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 the late monk, one said that busyness is an offense to the soul. Busyness is an mm. offense to the soul. We get so busy. And uh, I've been thinking about this a lot lately after doing, you know, I do meditation in the morning. And I was thinking, gosh, you know, uh, my life is so filled with distraction. Mm. So, even when I'm meditating, I notice all these distractions, you know, all these distractions. And then during the course of the day, all these distractions, you know, and I think it's built into the, it's kind of, uh, uh, baked into the system these days with your phone and email and everything that unless you're intentional about slowing down stepping out of the current a little bit and paying attention we're going to miss it we're simply going to miss it and um and so self-reflection in hope action theory has become a really crucial ingredient i think to effective career uh, management Again, simply focuses on the need to pay attention. Yeah. yeah. Well, and uh, I don't want to take this uh, off the rails here, but you know, I'm going, I'm going on a 70 mile backpacking trip in just a couple of days from from this yeah. interview. And one of the things that I absolutely love about these extended backpacking trips, which I, I've done with some friends of mine, we're usually out for eight to ten or more days, uh, is the fact that there's there's that busyness is reduced on the trail yeah. there's a, life is reduced to a bunch of simple decisions right we, we we're gonna eat we got to take the camp down we got to eat we're gonna walk we're gonna stop we're gonna have some lunch we're gonna walk 
and then we cut set up a tent. And so there's so this busyness is yeah. is is definitely packed into our life. But m- mindfulness and slowing, finding ways to slow down every day is so important. And I know Skip and I are are both big on mindfulness. But for me, I like to start my day mindfulness, and I know yeah. you do. Yeah. And I and two thirty in the afternoon, I really like to take a mindfulness break. It's the middle of the afternoon. A lot of your Daniel Pink talks about how yeah. the afternoon kind of that's not a great time for a lot of people. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take that time to do to listen to some meditation tapes. And yeah. uh, it, but it's it's harder to find, and and when people are busy, but you can you can stop that business for fifteen minutes because fifteen minutes is huge. It can be. We have this uh, um, unfortunate tendency, I think, many of us, uh, um, I'll I'll own it myself, of uh, thinking about things like that, mindfulness, taking that 15-minute mindfulness break and so forth, as doing nothing. Mm. And I've told this story before, but years ago, I went on a personal retreat at this... uh, retreat center out in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. It was run by this uh, uh, Catholic nun. She was about 80 years old. And uh, she was, uh, I was meeting with her for direction and it's kind of coaching. And uh, so she came into this dark room and she was about 4'11", something like that. And, uh, and, And I'm not Catholic, so I don't have a lot of experience with nuns in my life, but I'd heard about them from some friends. And I heard you know, some of them could be pretty powerful, right? And so, uh, oh, Sister Margaret Cecile. Oh, well. there, there you go. Okay, this was, this was Sister this Sister Therese, and uh, she became such a dear friend and really uh, an important influence in my life. Anyways, this first conversation, she said, "Well, tell me about yourself, right?" And so I did. I, I thought I, I I was doing that. I started telling her about all the things I was doing, and about oh gosh, it wasn't. I don't even know if it was five minutes into it. She yelled at me scared the hell out of me she yelled at me it was it was <laughs> she said stop and then she got a finger like that and like you focus far too much on human doing you need to focus more on human being Ooh, and i like thought it. wow you pegged me in five minutes she was mm. absolutely right mm. was absolutely right so this notion of mm. mindfulness breaks mm. meditation in the morning uh, whatever a person is, and there's so many different ways to do it. You know, so many different yeah. ways to do it. Yeah. But it, what it does is it simply uh, changes the pace enough to create the space enough for uh, insights to evolve, mm-hmm. right? You don't have to make them evolve. You just let them evolve. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, wow. You know, I, I would have missed that had I not done this. Um, you know, had I not taken this break. Had I not slowed down and to focus mm-hmm. on human being, not so much on human Doing. doing i have wow. another poem for you to read for me to you read. did such a nice job with the last one I am think. i reading this one yeah, here right here read, why not read this one this is from david white it's called sometimes sometimes if you move carefully through the forest breathing like the ones in the old stories who could cross a shimmering bed of leaves without a sound you come to a place whose only task is to trouble you with tiny but frightening requests conceived out of nowhere, but in this place, beginning to lead everywhere. Request to stop what you are doing right now and to stop what you are becoming while you do it. Questions that can make or unmake a life. Questions that have patiently waited for you. Questions that have no right to go away. There you go. Wow. I mean, right? I mean, when you slow down. Slow down. A lot of us, again, um, there's a there's a famous uh, Jungian uh, in the States. His name is James Hollis, best-selling author and all that kind of thing. And he talks about how, the, again, the two major obstacles for people in living a more uh, complete life, a fuller life, are fear and lethargy. Mm-hmm. That, you know, we just, it's, it's just easy to keep things going the way they're going. Mm-hmm. Whether or not they're working, it, it's, it's, it's just easier for me to stay in that three-year program rather than mm-hmm. quit in my first semester. Uh, it's uh, it, it's sometimes a scary to, to, to make a change, not knowing how it's going to work out. And I think often what we do is we focus too much on, will I succeed or fail, as opposed to what will I learn? 
you know, it's all about really, to me, it's all about learning. It's not about succeeding or failing mm -hmm. at all. It's all about learning, but <clears throat> slowing down in those questions that have no right to go away. Questions that can make or break a life, right? That if you don't address them, they don't necessarily go away, but sometimes the opportunities go away. And, uh, and so I think especially again, and, and, and not everybody's right for these kinds of, uh, it's not the right time, I should say, for everybody to have these conversations. But I think for many people, they're essential conversations that, uh, um, that sort of give you the opportunity, position you uh, for living a more meaningful uh, and fuller life, if we're willing to take them on. Because you can go back to Donald Super. Donald Super said the self-concept evolves over time, making choice and adjustment continuous processes. Self-concept evolves over time, making choice and adjustment continuous processes. We're constantly evolving. And not only that, we know that the world, think about the pandemic, right? We know that the world of work evolves over time, making choosing and adjusting continuous requirements. Both are true. And both mean you really have to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pay attention, often we, we get ourselves in those situations like, whoop, I didn't see that coming. Well, sometimes that, that that's the way it works. But sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, those questions are there and they've been there for us all along. They have no right to go away. And they're the questions that can make or break a life if we simply slow down, engage mm -hmm. in self-reflection, mindfulness, and pay attention. So for me, the, the other thing, I feel like there's, Decisions are made. We have a logical side, and then we also have this emotional mm -hmm. side. And that emotional side is is that that's that intuition, the hunches, you know, the, you know, the those the little voice, you know. And if you take the time to slow down, you're gonna you're able to use and thoughtfully use both sides of your brain. But if you're busy, 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 and always running, 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 you you never get that pause time. And I just think it's so. That's why I love that that. Uh, that that time to, to mm -hmm. slow down and i try to do a monthly uh, retreat where i take a day a tech free uh, day off richard lighter kind of turned me onto that in one of from one of his books but so, so we got we do need to wrap up i try to keep these to a half an hour um i want to um give you it any other final thoughts i guess the one other thing i wanted to mention was uh one of the one of the phrases that I always like and it kind of comes out of this decision making is that there's not a right or a wrong decision mm -hmm. it's a right or a left and so <laughs> sometimes you just need to make a decision and th then you live with it and then you you and then if you need to adjust you can adjust you know but it's not it's not about wrong and I think a lot of people get stuck in that too you know it is I don't want to be wrong um yeah. and so I think I think there's a there's yeah. that's a maybe a whole nother interview with you uh yeah. next year when you come back but yeah uh, no that's a great point it really is Jim and I think you know um uh, your your focus on intuition is uh, so important as well you know uh, how many millions of people have watched uh, Stephen Jobs uh, Stanford graduation speech but hmm. uh, if you haven't it's or even if you haven't watched it for a while it's probably worth uh re-watching and in that, he talks about the power of intuition. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that when we get so busy and so forth, my guess is the thing that we lose sight of is not maybe the rational side, but the intuitive side. Yeah. And uh, he talks about in that speech how uh, your heart knows usually well before your head. Your, your in intuition right. uh, is uh, speaking to you long before your rational side is speaking to you. And you can trust that intuitive sense of knowing and more and more even you know corporations are focused on helping employees develop their intuition helping leaders develop their intuition because we realize that it's a very powerful approach to making important decisions mm -hmm. especially when it comes to some of the biggest decisions we have to make well Thank you very much, Skip. It's Thanks, always Jim. a pleasure uh, for coming out to the camp. Oh, it's awesome to be out here, and uh, uh, really appreciate it. So, this is uh, Jim Peacock with Peak Careers Consulting, and I offer the facilitating career development class, uh, online seminars, uh, workshops. Uh, I have a book, The Field Guide for Career Practitioners, and I have a weekly uh, career email that comes out if you're willing to, if you're interested in signing up for that. But 
Final, thank you so oh, much for, no. for being here. This thank is you. great. I always enjoy this, uh, our time together. So thanks, Jim. Thank you.